Well, it's good to see each of you here this evening and pray for the Lord's blessing as we meet together in the middle of the week. This is our little oasis to be able to come together and worship our Lord. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 143, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph Let's take our Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 9. Last week I skipped over this portion and we went on through Genesis chapter 10. And afterward I was made aware that I had not read or commented on Genesis 9, 18 to 29. And it's a very important portion of scripture. So I want to come back to it. I think we can do that, can't we? Let's come on back and. Take a look at it together, Genesis chapter 9 and verses 18 to 29 will be my text, and then next time we'll move ahead to chapter 11, where we were ready to go this time, but this is important, Genesis chapter 9. This was after Noah and his sons came out of the ark, and it says here that the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. And these are the three sons of Noah. And of them was the whole earth overspread. That word overspread means dispersed. Out of these three sons, the entire earth was populated again after the flood. So we have here the sons of Noah named coming forth out of the ark, being Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they would have been named as the heads of the nation that we saw when we studied Genesis 10 last time. You remember we went through and looked what each of these represented. Japheth went north into Europe and over into Asia are his descendants, and Shem occupied what is known as Palestine in that particular area and down into Saudi Arabia, and then Ham would have been the father of the Canaanites, but also his children would have gone down into Egypt and Ethiopia. We saw that last time. <clears throat> but here specifically, for reasons that we're going to see, it says, and Ham is the father of Canaan. It's interesting that that word Canaan literally means a depressed or low one or a low lander would be another way of doing it. And he would have been 
an inhabitant of the coast there in what we know today as Palestine on the, on the west, as opposed to the loftier regions such as Aram, it would have been a low and depressed area. So even the name reflects where God purposed that he should dwell. But it also has some significance in his subjection. So even here, forward-looking, it is a prophecy of what God would do with the Canaanites, degrading them and subserving them unto Shem and uh, Japheth. But here it says in verse 20, And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Literally, it means, the word husbandman means literally a man of the ground. He would have been one whose fingers got dirty, planting. And this was what God gave him to do. He was a man of agriculture. Throughout scripture, you'll find these different terms to describe their occupation. You've got some that are called a man of war. Well, that tells you right there they would have been a soldier or a man of blood, a murderer, or a man of cattle. There's also in Exodus 4.10 a man of words, somebody that is eloquent perhaps and able to speak. But here he was called an husbandman and it says he planted a vineyard. So therefore, it specifies the particular type of occupation he had as a tiller of the ground. He planted a vineyard. Even up in Armenia, today, up in that northern part of Turkey, where the ark would have stayed after the, the flood, the waters went down, on Mount Ararat, that whole area today is known as a wine-growing country. So it's interesting that it was an, uh, an area particular for the, the growth of this type of product. Nothing wrong with growing wine. You know, that's not the issue here. But in verse 21, it says, And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered with his, within his tent. So we see here the word wine. It refers to some bubbly and fermented substance that would come from the grapes. Actually, this is the first mention of the word wine in Scripture. And I grew up under that sort of teaching that as soon as you mentioned wine in the same breath as a Christian, it was like, oh, you can't do that. You can't be a Christian and drink wine. Well, the problem wasn't the drinking of the wine. The wine was of the fruit of the ground. And throughout Scripture, it is part of the culture where it was part of the meal. Many times you would drink wine rather than the water because the water was not potable. But here, the problem was he was drunken. That's what it says there, and was drunken. It's a verb in the Hebrew, which literally means of strong drink or full of strong drink is what the word drunken means. And it has to do with being intoxicated as a result of too much drinking. There is a limit. It's not the wine that is the sin, but is the abuse of the wine. And so that's what we find here to be Noah's first sign of depravity in that he was not able to discipline himself and uh, drank quite a bit. Of course, someone said if you had spent that many days in the ark, you'd probably want to have a strong drink anyway, but that doesn't excuse it for him becoming intoxicated. He was 600 years old at the time of the flood, and uh, he was considerably beyond this when he gave birth to Ham. 
and Ham saw him overtaken in his fault. So it's not the wine, but it's the use of it. And, and here's the sin right here. It says in verse 21, he was uncovered within his tent. Literally, it's actually he uncovered himself. So that's something there in a drunken stupor state that he actually would have still known what he was doing. He made himself naked. So therefore, it implies and indicates personal guilt that Noah could in no way just b blame his son or sons. And as we know in other cases, intoxication does tend to lead to sensuality, such as the case of Lot. His daughters got him drunk, and they conceived, and some others that you can find. But he was within his tent. Some might say, well, he was in his tent, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is here that Ham, verse 22, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. The sense here is not just that he went into the tent and saw his nakedness and goes, oh, I shouldn't have seen my father's nakedness. It's interesting that that word nakedness that's used there is the same that was expressive of Adam and Eve after they ate the forbidden fruit. They saw that they were naked. It's the same word in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. So what was the sin of Ham? This was not a trifling, unintended transgression. The way that it is written here was that he not only saw the nakedness that he came upon Noah unexpectedly, but the way it's written is he actually laughed and rejoiced in what he saw considering Noah's state of intoxication and began to mock him and make fun of him. And it says there that he told his two brethren without. The idea there was with a malicious purpose telling his brethren, hey, you got to come see this. You're not going to believe it. And so inviting them to come look upon their father's shame. But here in verse 23, Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. They understood the seriousness of what Ham was telling them. And so they took a garment, literally a robe, which was on hand. It would have been some kind of outer cloak that they typically wore. And they laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward, purposing not to see their father's nakedness. This would have shown some regard, at least, in honoring their father, even though he was in a dishonorable state. And so in verse 24, we read that Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So even though he was intoxicated, and as we saw, he purposely undressed himself in that state of intoxication, he would have somehow in that intoxication also heard what Ham had to say, the mocking. And... Uh, this is the effect of wine. It's never good. What drunkenness. And when he became fully conscious of his condition and knew, some say by inspiration, but I think possibly it was just because of even in that semi-unconscious state that he would have overheard some of this conversation. What his younger son, and the, the way it's written there is the, literally his son, the little one, referring to Ham being the youngest. And so, generally, 
It has been believed to have been Ham, even though by man, many here when it mentions Ham, they understand Canaan, because the first thing he said there in verse 25 was, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. Some people question that as to why when Ham was the one that made the mockery, yet here we see it being his son Canaan being cursed. And that Shem out of this in, in verse 26 would be blessed for how he acted with regard to his father's nakedness. And Japheth, it says, would God would en enlarge Japheth. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servants. So that word cursed that you see there in verse 25 was a pronunciation of God's curse, particularly upon the not only Canaan, but his, his descendants, the Canaanites. And when you think about what God purposed with regard to the land many years later that he gave to Abraham and brought Israel into, it was a land that God had already cursed the inhabitants, that is the Canaanites, and purposed to give it to the sons of Shem. And some look at that and say, well, how could God do that? Well, he's God. You notice here, it wasn't Ham that was cursed, even though he had mocked, but it was Canaan, and Canaan was one of those sons, but there were other sons of Ham, but Canaan alone, through him, this curse would, would pass. So God had purpose that all of this take place and this is where you see God is sovereign over all things even in evil using it for his purpose he was the, uh, Ham's youngest son even as Ham was Noah's youngest son so Canaan was Ham's youngest son and it was upon him that God pronounced this curse that's God's prerogative Jacob have I loved, and what? Esau have I hated. God doesn't have to love anybody. He's not obliged to do so. And he will even use men's willful sins to accomplish his purpose when it comes to condemning them. You think about the greatest evil of all when they took the Lord Jesus Christ and crucified him. They did what they wanted to do, and yet God all the while was accomplishing what he had purposed to do. And the whole reason here is that Canaan would be the servant of Shem. You see that in verse 26, that when Israel would be brought into the land, God would subdue the Canaanites, and it comes all the way back to this point right here. So it's a precursor of what God had already determined should be, even though it would be many years later before this would be accomplished. And you notice it says, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. That word Lord God literally means Jehovah Elohim of Shem. It's two different words used for God. Jehovah is the I am God is the word Elohim. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But then of Shem, why of Shem? Well, that's going to be the seed of Abraham. And so God already here announces prophetically that the seed of Shem would be blessed because out of that seed would come the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how God, God's a God of history. There's no, no nation that God has ever raised up or put down, but it's been for his glory and honor. And here it was purposed that Canaan would be the servant of Shem. And uh, we see that historically as time went on. They were subdued by the Israelites. But God, that word God, as you see there in verse 27, same word as God in verse 26, 
means chief magistrate. That's what Elohim is. So when people say, well, do you have to believe in God's sovereignty in order to believe in God? You can't even say the word God and not know him to be sovereign over all. That's what that name means, a chief magistrate. When it says there in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created, doesn't even explain God. It just says he created heaven and earth. And then when you get over into John, of course, you see that was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ in whose hands God had put all authority and power. But he purposed here in verse 27 that the tents of Shem, it says he shall dwell, first of all it says shall enlarge Japheth. You wonder why the Europeans have such an influence in the world today? It comes right back to here. God said he would enlarge Japheth. And when you look at population-wise in the world, far more descendants of Japheth than there are of Shem, and particularly of Canaan. They're still fighting out over the land over there. You say, why is it that way? It's not white supremacy. It's God's supremacy that he purposed that through Japheth and his descendants that goes all the way up through Europe and all the way over to Asia, that they be the dominant powers of the world. And when you stop and think about, you know, in history, some of these European powers that have existed and continue to drive and influence the world today, it comes all the way back to here. Where do the sons of Shem look today when they're in trouble? They're looking toward Europe, and of course the descendants of Europe would be the United States. That's where they're looking for support. And God purpose that it should be that way. As we saw last time in Acts 17, God has set the bounds of man's habitation. He's created all out of one blood and determined those bounds to where none can go beyond what God has determined. And so in verses 28 and 29, we have the sum here that Noah lived after the flood 350 years. That's after the flood. He would have lived, if you do the calculation correctly, he would have lived to the 58th year of the life of Abram, Noah. And therefore was probably a witness even of the building of the Tower of Babel. When you look at the chronology of all of these things. And then the consequent dispersion of everybody from the Tower of Babel. Well... God had said that these three sons were to multiply and fill the earth. They were doing just the opposite in building in Babel, not far from where the ark would have been there in Mount Ararat. They're building a, a worship center. They were trying to unite everybody, and God, God had said, no, disperse. That was the order that he'd given so if you wonder today why there's so many different languages and peoples and cultures, it's because it comes right back to here. This is what God had determined. And so all the days of Noah were 950 years. And here's that all-important statement that you read, which shows the consequence of being fallen creature. It doesn't matter how long they lived. It says, and he died. That's going to be the end of everybody that the Lord puts on this earth, no matter how long they live. And it's God that determines it. Yet that curse of the fall is still there. And he died. So that's the story that leads up to chapter 10 that we saw last time of where all of these were dispersed and where they went in their generations. And then, Lord willing, we'll pick up on chapter 11 the next time. Hopefully that catches us up a little bit. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the clarity of it that you have sovereignly ruled and overruled in determining history, places, nations, men, their life spans, and even the times of their death. You truly are a sovereign God. 
And I pray that you would enable us to see your hand in all things, not only in creation and in providence, but particularly in salvation, that if you have purposed to be merciful to sinners such as we are, it's for Christ's sake. All of this was setting the stage whereby thousands of years later you would bring your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through that lineage that you blessed in Shem. It wasn't for Abraham's sake, but it was for Christ's sake. And how in him now all of the nations of the earth are blessed in that you have a people out of every tribe, nation, and tongue that Christ has paid their sin debt and uh, them also you must bring. We wouldn't know you. We wouldn't even be able to read this word with any kind of understanding apart from your blessing by your spirit in Christ. And I thank you for that. I pray that you would continue to be with us as we continue our time of worship. And uh, I give you the praise and honor and glory in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's take our hymn book and turn to hymn number 163. This is a good prayer for us as we continue to look at the word that the Lord would open our eyes that we might behold his glory in Christ. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Look with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. We'll begin here in Acts chapter 10 with verse 36. And I want to speak with you about the Lord of all. We're looking at the different titles for the Lord Jesus Christ going through the L's. And actually, we're going to have a number that pertain to him being Lord. Here it is Lord of all and in this context well, we see it in verse 36 this is Peter that's declaring this word in the presence of Cornelius a Gentile so this helps us understand the sense of Lord of all not just the Lord of the Jew but of the Gentile and this was pronounced in a Gentile home. Peter had grown up all his life and never set foot inside of a Gentile home. And now the Lord had sent him to Cornelius, 
who was one of the Lord's all along, chosen by God the Father, one for whom Christ had paid the debt, and the Spirit was already in him, where he and his household were worshiping and praying. He would have been a Roman. He was a centurion of the band called the Italian Band. So quite an elite soldier, and yet one taught of the Lord. And I dare say that this was as much for Peter's sake as it was for Cornelius that the Lord sent for him to come to Cornelius. And so what we're reading here in Acts 10, 36 is really a part of a message that Peter would have pronounced there in that home. Because it says in verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth, and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't look down and see this sinner and say, well, I think I like him, so I want to choose him. And then look over there and say, I like that one particularly, so I'm going to choose him. No, God is no respecter of persons. His choice of sinners that he purposed to save really is opposite of anything that man thinks because he didn't choose the best. He didn't choose Cornelius because he was a man of, of honor and well-known. No, he was a sinner. That's the one common denominator of all those that God has chosen, that they are sinners. In fact, Paul writes of that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 when he declares that it wasn't the strong or the mighty, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27, he says, but God has chosen what? The foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So don't even think that God sent Peter to Cornelius because here was a man of honor that would probably serve the church well, and so he went and chose him. No, the foolish things... It says, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things. It goes from bad to worse of the world. And things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Even as a Gentile, Cornelius would have been despised by Peter and his Jewish Kin. They didn't have anything to do with Gentiles. They were Gentile dogs. And yet when Peter was told in that dream, don't call unclean what God has declared to be clean, he was brought to see exactly what he's declaring here. That's the best way to preach a message is out of being taught of God and experience, not just out of information. And that's certainly what Peter is saying. Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Otherwise, why would I be in here in a Gentile home right now? And there he says in verse 35, But in every nation, he that feareth him, and that's certainly where Peter found Cornelius, fearing God. How was it that he was fearing God? Well, that was the Spirit of God already at work in him. A man's not going to fear God. In fact, that's one of the indications of a person being in a natural state of mind is there's no fear of God in them. That's what Paul wrote there in Romans 3. But here he feared God, and it says, and worketh righteousness. He's not talking about his own works of righteousness there, but works that which God's righteousness imputed dictates when you understand that you're a sinner and that your only hope of salvation is in the work of Christ having been imputed to your account it humbles you it causes you to desire to give him all the glory you're not seeking your own glory and that's what it is to work righteousness and when it says there is accepted with him 
It's not that these are the conditions to being accepted, but read it this way. If you find one that fears God and you find one that works righteousness, in other words, looks to the righteousness of God alone that Christ earned and established and he imputed, that is an indication that he is already accepted with him, accepted in the beloved. So don't put the cart before the horse there to say that if you fear and you work righteous, then you will be accepted. No. If you are accepted already of God by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will fear him and then you will be submitted to that one righteousness. You have no other. And then verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel. Preaching what? Peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. So he's acknowledging that God initially had sent this message unto the children of Israel. All the way through the Old Testament, the prophets, the prophecies, the promises, the types, all of those were through the children of Israel. And that word God sent unto them, and what was the word? Notice it's not in plural, it's singular. Preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Peace being the satisfaction of a holy God by Jesus Christ when he had shed his blood unto death. And God then imputed that work to the account of those for whom he paid the debt. But when he says there the, the, that he is Lord of all, that means that applies to both Gentile and Jew. Don't read it in the sense of Lord of all in, in that God wants every single person then to be at peace. Had that been the case, they would be. But here the word all has to do with an ethnic sense in which he is Lord. He is Lord of every single person. He rules and reigns over all men. But when it comes to this matter of salvation, he's Lord of all in the ethnic sense, Jew and Gentile. So this is the foundation for Peter's understanding that the gospel should now go forth to the Gentiles. Christ never said that it shouldn't. In fact, he announced there as he was ascending into glory, he told them to go wait into Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the Spirit. And what did he tell them? When the Spirit is poured out, you shall be witnesses unto me first in Jerusalem and Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world. So it wasn't anything hidden or secret that now suddenly because the Jews had turned thumbs down on Christ that Christ was now turning to the nations. No, it had always been God's purpose. And you can see it even in the Old Testament with Abraham. He was not a Jew when God called him. He was a Syrian. He was uncircumcised. And then you've got examples of Rahab and you've got examples of Ruth. They weren't of the Jewish nation and yet God had purposed that they should be of this redeemed number that when Christ came he would pay their sin debt. So this statement that Peter's making here goes completely against the prevailing Jewish thought at that time that God certainly was showing partiality. That was their thinking that he favored the Jew. We've got a lot of that going on today. In spite of what the scriptures say, that Christ is Lord of all, and that there's not one nation that he perceives to be better than another. He's not a respecter of persons, but boy, you can't convince the majority of so-called Christendom today where they think, no, he's, his favorite people is still the Jews. And that's why they continue to send all that money over there. And then, and Israel's happy. They'll use that money. But they're going against what God himself has declared. There's no partiality with God with regard to Jew or Gentile. 
in Christ, Paul wrote to the Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free. And that's what Christ's work has accomplished. But there were many Jews of Peter's day that thought that God loved the Jews. If you were Jew, you were loved. And if you were Gentile, you were hated. In fact, their teaching was that Gentiles, that's why God created them, for fodder, for the fires of hell. And that that applied to all of the Gentiles. In fact, it was common for a Jewish man to begin the day with a prayer, so-called prayer, but this is how they were taught, thanking God, first of all, that he was not a slave, second, not a Gentile, now, this is a Jewish man praying now. And thirdly, not a woman. So they lumped them all in there. Slave, Gentile, woman. And that was the prominent thought of the day, even when Christ came. That's why I said he came on his own, his own received him not. Because he didn't give credence to that sort of thinking as if somehow he had come just for the Jews. Had that been the case, there would not be any hope for me. I'm not, I don't have any Jewish blood in me. As I mentioned last time, I'm from Gomer. I'm one of those Germanic sons of Japheth. And uh, had that been the case, there'd be no hope for Ken Weimer. So when the Jews showed this kind of partiality, they weren't being faithful to the word nor to the God of Scripture. Because all throughout the Old Testament, the very scriptures they were reading, but they were reading with a veil over their hearts, prevented them from seeing that God shows no partiality. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 10, for example, in verse 17. So that's the importance of this title of Christ, Lord of all, that there's no partiality with him, that Jew or Gentile, those that God the Father had chosen and given to him, he redeemed. He didn't put any more requirement on a Gentile to be redeemed than a Jew. Lord of all. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17. It says here, <clears throat> For the Lord your God is God of gods, there's that word Elohim again. And Lord, that's a word which means master, Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty, and a terrible to be revered. Here it is, which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. People today still haven't learned that in their blindness. They think that somehow God expects something from them. And so they come with something in their hand, whether it's their decision, they think they're doing God a favor by believing on his son, or whether it's their works, they think that there's something that God requires in order for them to find acceptance with God. But here it's very clear, even in the Old Testament scriptures, that it's not based on any partiality with God. So you come back here again, the foundation is there in verse 35. In every nation, so when it speaks of him being Lord of all, we know and understand that in every nation, tribe and tongue, there is a people that God has already chosen for whom Christ has already paid their sin debt and them he must bring, them he must call out. That's pretty clear when you get over to Revelation. There's a couple of scriptures in the book of Revelation that underscore this. In Revelation chapter 5, specifically, I want you to see the wording here in verse 9. Here it's speaking of those around the throne of glory who have gone on before. These would have been those that Christ took with him when he emptied Sheol, the side of paradise, and now they're enjoying his presence there and awaiting the others that 
are to join them. To be absent from the body is to be present for the Lord. It says they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, executed, put to death, just like they took the animals in the Old Testament without spot and without blemish and slew them, shed their blood unto death. That's what Christ did and has redeemed us Notice the connection with being slain and redeemed. Once the death occurred, the redemption was accomplished. It's not awaiting some later point in which somehow these would believe and then they would be redeemed. No. Thou was slain and has past redeemed us. That's a one-time act accomplished to God by thy blood. It's not on the ground of his blood, but by that very shed blood, when it was shed. That's when justification took place. That's when every one of God's elect were redeemed out of, it says, every kindred and tongue and pe people and nation. It has made us unto our God kings and priests. He made a kingdom of priests unto the Father. Everyone that he's redeemed is a priest unto God. Christ is the high priest. We serve the high priest, but we serve in that kingdom as priests being appointed by Christ to that end. But we don't offer up blood sacrifices. We offer sacrifices of praise unto him. And it says we shall reign on the earth. The idea there is we continue to reign on the earth. Everyone that Christ has redeemed, he's made a kingdom already. This is not some future earthly kingdom to come, but they reign even now. Those that have gone before reign from glory with him. And those of us that are still here, if Christ has redeemed us and called us, we reign now with him even though the world doesn't perceive us that way. We're the off-scouring of the world, but we're sons of the king, redeemed. And we can expect that even as they didn't recognize the Lord Jesus Christ and spat on him for declaring that he was the son of God and equal with God, they'll do the same with you. Try talking to people who base their hope of salvation on their profession. And then you come along and say it's not based on profession, but it's based on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God did the choosing. You didn't. God did. They'll get upset at you. That's not anything they want to hear. But we're not to think that somehow God sees color. Pretty clearly, he's no respecter of persons. And he doesn't respect the white man any more than he does the black man to belittle the black man and think that somehow the white man is more significant, you're a rebel for even thinking it. There is no, before God, Jew or Gentile, bond or free. And we deal with every one of God's creatures the same because they're God's creatures. I don't know whose or his or who's not, but any kindness I can show to whomever it is is a kindness that God has purposed that we show. And if they're the Lord, you've, shown kindness to one of his elect. And if they're not, that may be the only kindness they ever know before God eternally condemns them. God doesn't look at color. He doesn't look at economic status. Some people think the United States is blessed. Look how he's blessed us economically. Well, he could wipe that all out in a day. A lot of shaking going on right now. But he sees those that he has chosen in his son. Imagine that, giving gift of sinners to his son. You think, what kind of gift is that? Well, he did it to honor him as a savior, as a redeemer, as a justifier. And so that's why it says here, he is Lord of all. That's a powerful phrase. I know we read it to begin with and think, well, Okay, he's Lord of all. But when you consider, first of all, that he's Lord of all, 
it shows that when he came in the flesh, he wasn't a mere man. He was the God-man, the Lord of all. That shows his deity. Peter could never have said this were it not that he saw and perceived that Christ was God. And then furthermore, Lord of all, meaning both of Jew and Gentile. And when you go on and read there of how he witnessed to this one, you realize that in speaking of Christ, you don't just talk about his person, but his work. It's Christ and him crucified. That's what I listen for in a man that's preaching. That's what I endeavor to do as I preach, to bring out who he is and why he came and what he accomplished. Here, Peter very clearly says it was the word sent unto the children of Israel, but preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Peace with God, satisfaction with God by Jesus Christ. Not for anything that we are due to our race or economic status or whatever, but because of who he is. And he goes on to declare whom, down in verse 39, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. But him God raised up on the third day. You see that in verse 39 and 40. And showed him openly, not to all the people. So even there in Christ's appearances, it was selective. Who was he going to? Those for whom he died. People say, we've got to get the gospel out in the world so everybody can hear. And God never purposed that everybody should hear. But he has purposed that those for whom Christ paid the debt should hear. That's why I preach. I'm on the trail of God's sheep. And he says, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. It speaks there in verse 37. It, it's as if Peter's going right down through the life of Christ through this whole section here, verse 37, all the way to the end. He was baptized, not because he had any need of Baptism, as far as any sin was concerned, no. But to manifest his humanity and why he came. He was anointed, it says there in verse 38, with the Holy Spirit. That's who he is as Christ, the anointed one with power. It says he went about doing good there in verse 38 and healing, delivering those oppressed by the devil. What did that demonstrate? His power to save. If he can heal a physical illness, he can certainly heal a spiritual, which is our greatest problem anyway. But all this he did with the power of God the Father. It says there in verse 38, for God was with him. That's what the name Emmanuel means, God with us. And he did these things in the presence of eyewitnesses. He didn't do this in a corner somewhere for a, an elite few. And he was crucified, he was raised from the dead in the sight of many witnesses. And this is the message that he commands and has commanded his followers to preach. The message of who he is and why he came, who he did it for, what he accomplished by it and where he is now. And therefore now, he, as it says down there in verse 42, he commanded this to be preached to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be what? Judge of the quick and the dead. Judge of the living and the dead. And all of this, he says, was foretold already by the prophets. See that in verse 43? What a message Peter's declared here. Standing in Cornelius' home, having just been taught himself that God was no respecter of persons, even though he'd been raised otherwise. He says, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, in verse 41. There, Peter, why does he stress eating and drinking with Christ? Well, it's a way of saying that Christ was a, Christ's resurrection was a real resurrection. It wasn't just a phantom, a ghost. 
that appeared. He died and he rose again as a man and commanded that he be preached to the people and to testify that he was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. The apostle Peter wasn't very long in this message, was he, before he came to the, the heart of it. And that's why I say, if you want to find out if a man's been son of God, just you don't have to listen for an hour to figure out. Or especially if you leave and wonder, well, I wonder what he really said. That's not a man sent from God. The very doctrine of Christ is there preeminent from the beginning all the way to the end. And that the Lord Jesus Christ is the judge. Now when it says here, I wanted to bring this up before I close in verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. That's another one of those, just like we saw in verse 35. If you get it wrong, you've missed it completely. Just like in verse 35, it's not saying in every nation he that feareth and works righteousness shall be accepted with him. He's saying is accepted. That's why he fears and that's why he works that righteousness, declares it. Same thing here. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, literally the tense of that is shall continue to receive remission of sins. The fact that they believe is an indication that their sins have already been remitted. Where were they remitted? At the cross. And so their believing is a testimony that they continue to receive the benefit of the remission of sins that was accomplished by Christ at the cross. It's not saying whoever believes, then your sins will be remitted. That's what all these false preachers are saying. If you'll just believe on Jesus and believe he's the son of God, then you can hope to have your sins forgiven. Now, if your sins weren't forgiven at the cross, they'll never be forgiven. And that any believing is going to be the fruit or the effect of Christ already having put away your sin. That's why you believe. But here again, when you see that whosoever believeth. See, people like to hang on to that and say, well, it says whosoever. No, it says whosoever believeth. It doesn't say whosoever doesn't believe. So it's speaking specifically of a particular people. But when it says whosoever, wherever you see that in Scripture, it's referring to Jew or Gentile. It's referring to slave or free, male or female, white or black. No distinction with a holy God, whosoever. That's what it's talking about. Rich or poor, that's not what God considers. He's no respecter of person, but whosoever believes. I'm thankful that God doesn't consider our person. That's not what he's looking to. He's looking to the person of his son. He's looking to the finished work of his son that's satisfied. When he causes you to believe, you're believing on a satisfied God. That's, that's an amazing thing. Because we know he's holy, he's just. But he could never be satisfied in any other way than through the work of his son. I like that expression, don't you? Lord of all. You can't look down your nose at anybody. You think, well, he's less deserving than this one. If you're thinking that way, then you haven't understood yourself. I even hear people say, I sure am glad I was born in the United States of America. Well, if you were one of his elect and born in some remote place in the far reaches of a, a third world country, you think God didn't know about you, wouldn't have brought you? If Christ paid your debt, you're his. That's good news. And hymn number 144. Hark, 10,000 harps and voices.
smile enlightens cheers and charms thy saints on earth when we think of love like thine lord we own in love divine alleluia 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 amen king of glory reign forever thine and everlasting Sever those whom thou hast made thine own, happy objects of thy grace, destined to behold thy face. Alleluia, 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 amen. Savior, haste and thine appearing, bring, O oh, bring the glorious day. summons hearing heaven and earth shall pass away then with golden harps we'll sing glory glory to our king alleluia 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 amen all right with that we'll be dismissed look forward to our next time lord willing